Good morning. I'm Herb Kimball. Uh, this is part two of hand and wrist injuries in athletes. I'm one of the uh, hand surgeons here at New England Baptist Hospital. And we'll be uh, looking at the second part of our discussion. Um, when uh, initially we, we went over tendon injuries and common fractures, today we'll be looking at carpal instability, TFCC tears, and other injuries that occur in athletes. When we think about ligament injuries, we uh, think about the traumatic acute injuries uh, and that those uh, that may be an attenuation of a ligament versus a, a complete rupture. And for us, the physical exam is very important. In particular, we'll go over some specific stress tests that will help us determine what type of injury there is. Um, when we're evaluating athletes, we uh, need to look at x-rays and other imaging modalities like fluoroscopy and occasionally and we're using MRI or arthrograms to help us in our diagnosing uh, these uh, type of injuries. Looking first at uh, carpal instability, when we uh, look at the ligaments that uh, are around the wrist, the important ligament for us and most commonly injured is the scapholunate ligament. That ligament goes between the lunate and the scaphoid and it predominantly involves the dorsal aspect of uh, the ligament between the two bones that has the structural support. Uh, when we look at what can happen uh, with these injuries with a fall on a wrist for an athlete, uh, we can have dislocations, complete dislocation of carpal bones or subluxation of carpal bones. Now when we look at the scaphololunate ligament injury, that's typically a subluxation. Uh, for chronic injuries that occur, uh, we can see over time patients may develop a traumatic arthritis. So it's important to recognize these and treat these uh, appropriately on uh, an acute setting. In the diagnosis, certain clinical exams can help uh, determine what type of injury you're dealing with. We look at the, firstly, with the history, the injury mechanism. How did the athlete fall? Was it a collision? Was it a fall on the wrist? And with that, we'll get to examine the athlete and look for areas of point tenderness. When we're specifically dealing with the uh, scaphololunate ligament, we uh, can find that anatomically on the athlete's wrist or patient's wrist. In particular, we look for an area right distal to the Lister's tubercle, which is the prominence on, the, on your distal radius just distal to that between the lunate and the and the scaphoid is that ligament and you can feel that with palpation another test that's important to check for injury to that ligament would be the scaphoid shift test in that case uh, we start with the wrist in a uh, radial deviate uh, radial deviated position and uh, bring it over into an ulnar deviated position with palpa palpating the volar surface of the scaphoid and with that then radially deviating and trying to get the scaphoid to flex out of position and if the ligament is fully torn you'll see that that bone will clunk or catch as it as it goes between that position and with that painful stress test would that would be an indication of a scaphololunate ligament tear other ligaments in the, uh, in the wrist that are important uh, would be the lunotriquetral ligament. That, that's a typical lunotriquetral ballotment test where two hands are used to stress the lunotriquetral ligament. Another stress test is the catch-up clunk to look for mid-carpal instability. Uh, we may talk about that in a little bit. Back to the scaphololunate ligament. Again, the athlete is typically fallen on the, an extended wrist they will complaining of dorsal wrist pain and swelling. After an evaluation and, and uh, concern for a scaphololunate injury, we look at the radiographs. And for uh, injuries that are significant, that involve a complete tear, we'll see alteration in the way that the bones look on the radiographs. The picture on your right here shows uh, a lateral view of the carpal bones in the wrist and this scaphololunate ligament angle. This angle is measured between the long axis of the scaphoid and a perpendicular line to the lunate itself. Uh, with this type of a tear, uh, the 
bones, uh, the lunate and the scaphoid, shift. And by the, this shifting, this angle increases. Uh, and so we'll see normally uh, an angle of uh, 40 to 60 degrees. And then with an injury, that, that angle will be over 60 degrees. Uh, radiologists may term that a DZ malalignment. You may see that in, in some of the reports. Uh, but that just refers to the fact that the lunate now tilts dorsal. Another way to look at uh, injuries to the scapholunate ligament is to, on the standard PA radiographs, you'll see a gap. And uh, in this uh, series of x-rays, these two PA views, you see on the right a significant gap between the two bones. And that represents the torn ligament. MRI can also be helpful in cases where it's difficult to ascertain whether or not there's really been a significant injury. Sometimes there's significant swelling or the exam is equivocal. Uh, MRI is helpful and in this case uh, between those two bones there you see some abnormal signal and they would read that as a scaphalunate ligament tear. So for athletes with partial tears, uh, typically we're splinting them and re-examining them, re them in about two weeks. Um, that will give us a better sense uh, for those uh, that are um, on the professional level, we may be getting an MRI right, at, right away for those athletes. Um, arthrography can be helpful in the sense that dye is placed in the joint, and with that dye, uh, you're able to see if there's leakage between the bones, which would indicate a tear. Um, with partial tears, we uh, will uh, typically uh, try to, to treat them conservatively with casting. Um, usually four to six weeks in a cast, uh, but if they fail that type of a treatment, we'll be thinking about doing arthroscopy for a debridement. When we do find uh, patients with complete tears, uh, we have to think about doing uh, surgical repair. Now, in early, uh, acute setting, that is usually within uh, six weeks of the diagnosis, we feel confident that uh, a primary repair of the ligament is the best option. And that would involve an, an open incision on the wrist and, and uh, going in to find the ligament tear and then repairing the ligament and ultimately pinning the bones together to, to uh, hold the ligament repair stable for typically about three months. Other options are to add some tissue or, or capsule to the repair, and that can be done by dorsal capsule adhesis. Um, there have been other uh, ways of managing this. Uh, in the chronic setting where a tendon reconstruction can be done, and we'll show a little slide on that, uh, or potentially fusing some of the bones together, uh, although a little less popular. With an incision, you can see uh, into the carpus and, and ultimately see the tear of the scaphalunate ligament depicted here at the arrow. When we talk about the chronic cases, uh, this slide here just depicts uh, a cartoon of how a ligament can be reconstructed by using one of the tendons uh, or, or part of the tendon from the flexor side of the wrist. So this is a flexor carpi radialis reconstruction known as a modified Brunelli technique. And the tendon itself is weaved through the scaphoid to recreate that ligament. Again, as I mentioned, with the repair, um, even with the chronic reconstructions, we are immobilizing them for about six, uh, for about excuse me, uh, 8 to 12 weeks. Uh, pins are helpful to, to maintain the reduction and uh, ultimately they do typically get removed. Uh, after the pins are removed and, and the casting is done, we begin therapy for, for uh, range of motion exercises and, and uh, strengthening it about three months. Now, when we look at other type of injuries that can happen to the wrist, this is a case um, of a typical uh, at college athlete that has a fall on the wrist but goes with a uh, lack of a diagnosis here. So the radiologist in the emergency room may see this x-ray and not pick up on the fact that uh, there's something wrong here. It looks like the bones are relatively well aligned until you look into the center at the lunate bone is shape it is not in its normal uh, view of the lunate that you would see. So what we're looking at there is a lunate or perilunate dislocation. These are injuries that require urgent attention. Um, the mechanism is usually a fall on an extended wrist or dorsiflex wrist 
with some ulnar deviation to the wrist and, and carpal rotation. Mayfield classified these, and the slide on the right just shows uh, a white line through the mechanism of force that, that occurs uh, with this type of an injury and how the ligaments are, are injured through that. Ultimately, as the force is greater, it can cause a lunate to completely dislocate. So when we see uh, an x-ray like the previous one, we want to make sure that we get a lateral radiograph, and this is the lateral here depicting how the lunate is malpositioned. It's no, no longer in its proper position. Instead, the lunate should be sitting as depicted here at, on, on this red highlight. So we know that this is a lunate dislocation. Uh, in most instances, uh, it's difficult to reduce these type of dislocations. We do try a closed uh, reduction, and if that's possible under anesthetic, we're able to percutaneously pin those bones together. Uh, but in more than not instances, we are opening and reducing this, and uh, the technique involves typically a, a palmar side incision and also a dorsal side incision to address this. We look for articular lesions of the, of the lunate and the, and the capitate, uh, and we also repair the ligaments and capsule. Again, because it's a carpal ligament injury, we are pinning these. The slide here depicts the volar view or the palmar view of this lunate dislocation. The lunate is actually in the carpal canal with the flexors and the median nerve. So we have to uh, unroof the, the carpal ligament, uh, move the flexor tendons out of the way to find the lunate, and then we push it back into the wrist joint. And you can see the little defect of the capsule where the lunate uh, had protruded. Now spinning around to the back of the wrist, we're able to see where the scaphal lunate ligament is torn. Uh, the lunate is now back in its, its appropriate position, and we're able to now get some sutures and repair that ligament, and ultimately put some pins uh, between the carpal bones. Uh, as shown here on these radiographs, showing the realignment of the normal carpal um, bones and the, uh, the pinning to provide stability. Now, moving on to uh, the ulnar side of the wrist, where a common problem uh, for athletes is uh, injuries to the TFCC. Now, what is the TFCC? Well, the TFCC is a triangular fibrocartilage complex. It consists of an articular disc, the radial ulnar ligaments, the meniscal homolog, and the subsheath of the extensor carpi, radial, uh, carpi ulnaris. This slide here shows a little bit better uh, the anatomy of what we're talking about. Um, it is, it's a complex um, region for the wrist uh, and sort of a black box for some physicians, but uh, in essence, you can think of it like a meniscus for the knee, uh, along with some supporting ligamentous structures. Uh, the majority of the injuries that occur to the TFCC involve the meniscus part, or the periphery, where um, that sort of shock absorber acts to, once it's injured, acts as a, as a source for inflammation. Uh, more significant injuries to the TFCC would involve the ligaments, the ligamentous structure where by you'd have instability of the distal radial ulnar joint. So we look at these uh, type of injuries to the TFCC and they've been classified as traumatic and degenerative. Uh, typically in the athlete we're, we're talking about the acute tear. Again, this would be a fall in a pronated uh, forearm position uh, onto the wrist. And typically we see those as peripheral tears. Um, for older patients, older athletes, or or laborers, we may see uh, chronic tears that are injured or acutely injured on top of chronic injuries. Um, typically those patients have an ulnar positive variance, that is their ulna is a little longer than their radius, and we see that more in the central portion of the TFCC, the tears. The central portion um, is a relatively avascular zone. Uh, repairs in the central portion don't typically uh, uh, work because there's not enough vascular supply and we'll talk about that in a minute. But on to diagnosis of the TFCC injury. Uh, the patient or athlete will typically complain of ulnar-sided wrist pain 
um, particularly pain with uh, gripping rotation or pronation. They may have clicking, and a clinical exam that's uh, useful for, for patients is to feel for the ulnar fovea. Um, what uh, the examiner does is to find the ulnar styloid and the extensor carpi ulnaris and then drop just volar to that and you'll feel that little what's called an ulnar snuff box and in that little area with point tenderness there that's the fovea and that has been uh, associated with diagnosis of TFCC tear. Um, we also stress them and, and see if they have pain with that pronation and supination as uh, previously described. Now in order to help make the diagnosis of a TFCC tear uh, we uh, will oftentimes use an MRI uh, with or without arthrography. Um, for those uh, acute tears that occur in younger patients, we typically cast them for four to six weeks, uh, hoping that they can heal on their own. W this slide here depicts the various locations that we can see uh, injuries. Uh, one and two uh, show more central injuries. Again, that's a less vascular area and uh, the four and three are in the periphery uh, with uh, three being more involving potentially the ultimate ligamentous stability of the distal radial ulna joint. So for uh, further subdivision we look at the peripheral tears and the central tears. Uh, the slide here with, at the arrow shows again a peripheral tear. Uh, for those cases uh, that we uh, elect to operate on, this is the type of uh, a tear that we're able to repair. Typically what we'll do after the repair is immobilize them in a cast that limits the rotation of your forearm for about four weeks. And then after that they're, they move to a splint that's removable and begin therapy. Uh, for the central tears, uh, there's not much to do other than to clean those up or to breed them and they typically need a little less immobilization, maybe two to four weeks in a short arm cast. The slide now shows the arrows at more of a central location, the ones that we would debride. Here's um, an ice climber that was able to get back to climbing Franconia Notch at about four months after the repair. And that's typical. We would see them at uh, probably about three to six months getting back to sports specific activities. And uh, so for this talk, we'll, we'll wrap it up with um, a few other specific, sports-specific injuries. Um, and in particular with gymnastics, that's a, a very common problem. We see a lot of gymnasts. And for them, um, they have a lot of load that goes across their wrists. And usually the young adolescent gym, gymnasts uh, will have some impingement of the capsule uh, of their wrist joint from a repetitive forceful extension. And uh, the things that we worry about is that may uh, cause uh, similar type symptoms are occult ganglions. Uh, but typically what we see instead is um, radiographs that, that show here on your right what is a, a physeal stress. That's widening of the growth plate from repetitive stress. Unfortunately for these uh, young athletes, uh, the only treatment for this is rest um, and, uh, and they have to sit out for, for several months in order to improve. And they typically get better without surgery. In uh, competitive cyclists, we can see compressive neuropathies. That is carpal tunnel syndrome or ulnar nerve compression. Uh, ulnar nerve compression at the wrist is more common in the cyclists because of their uh, handlebars. Uh, they have to, in that downward sloping position, have to put a lot of force uh, across the ulnar nerve as it's uh, entering into the hand. And with that, uh, they'll get typically numbness and tingling or some weakness in the hand. Uh, the management for that is typically changing the handlebars or, or getting padded gloves or uh, repositioning themselves with the bicycle and changing the fit of the bike. Uh, if that doesn't help, uh, then there are instances where we, we are able to release the nerve and improve their symptoms. Uh, in particular for boxers, uh, MMA is becoming a more popular sport, uh, so striking. Um, for boxers, they hit repetitively over the top of their knuckles, and they'll get injuries to the sagittal band, which is uh, the area 
that goes right over the top of the metacarpal phalangeal joint and holds and centers the extensor tendon. So with repetitive injury to the sagittal band, they can get attenuation or inflammation and ultimately can cause the tendons to sublux. If the tendon slides over to the side, the athlete may have trouble extending their finger because it's no longer at its mechanical advantage. In those cases, um, we would typically splint them for a period of time to see if that will heal. If it doesn't, they may need surgery to repair the sagittal band. So that pretty much wraps up our talk for today. Uh, we do have some future topics coming, hand and wrist anatomy along with clinical examination uh, to help, uh, along with um, possibly a topic for common elbow problems. Uh, all this will be accessible by nebh.org, and uh, there are some other uh, diagnoses and, and uh, treatments that can be found at bostonhand.com. So thank you, and we'll take questions.